Okay, a tough old cowboy from Texas counseled his granddaughter that if she wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a pinch of gunpowder on her oatmeal every morning. The granddaughter did this religiously until she was 103 when she died. She left behind 14 children, 30 grandchildren, 45 great-grandchildren, 25 great-great-grandchildren, and a 40-foot hole where the crematorium used to be. <laughs> there have been a lot of books written about the promises of God. I remember when we were first saved, there was one out called the Jesus Person Pocket Promise Book. It was a little book you, bit you put in your pocket. And all these promises were in there. We'd carry those around and read a promise if you're facing something. So we're talking about promises of God and specifically the promise of his presence. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, this morning as we have gathered in your house and we've done so in your name, we expect you to be here with us. And as we have opportunity to look into these morsels from your word, we pray that you will bless them to the hearts of everyone that's in here today in Jesus' name. Amen. So here are some of the, just a few of the promises that are in Scripture. Isaiah 41.10 So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a good promise. Deuteronomy 31.8 the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. And here's one in Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Just think of that. That's God hovering over us. And here's one in Matthew chapter 11 and 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, heavy laden in the King James. I kind of like that King James. And I will give you rest. And here's one in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And here's one in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And here's one in the book of Exodus chapter 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you. You just need to be still. That was the occasion when they looked up and the Pharaoh was there with 600 chariots and all the other chariots, the best chariots and all the rest of them. And, they were, and the Red Sea was at their backs. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. That's an assurance. That's a promise of God's presence. Isaiah 43, 2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And one from Isaiah 54 and verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prevail. Prosper in the King James. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Have you ever stood on a promise from God? Have you ever had to stand on his promises? Sometimes there is nowhere else to turn to. We exhaust all the possibilities and then we turn to God. That's a human frailty. Instead of going to him first, sometimes we do that. We exhaust all the things we can run to and then we turn to God. Give him the leftovers of our problem. Moses had a special request. And God promised his presence. He promised that he would go with Moses. This is in Exodus chapter 33. And it starts out this way. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought out from Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. So the request was based on a threat that God would not accompany them. And the people heard those words. It wasn't Moses, it was the people that he was upset with. When the people heard these distressing words in verse 4, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, You are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. God's words now, Take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. Imagine being out there in the wilderness and hearing those words from God. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. The people repented because of the Lord's threat. The ornaments must have been offensive to God. If you think about it, ornaments are self-glorifying. You put on ornaments and it, that's to, to pretty yourself up or to make yourself seem important in some cases. Some people overdo it, some don't. But they're self-glorifying. And self-glorifying is the opposite of humility. God wanted them to be humble in his presence and to give him glory. His presence was there with them. And he said, now take off the ornaments because that was self-glorification. Remember that it was the presence of God that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. It was, it, it was the presence of God that brought the plagues onto the Egyptians. It was his presence that divided the Red Sea so they could go through as if on dry ground. It was the presence of God that brought them water from the rock because they were thirsty and there was no water in the wilderness in the desert for them. It was the presence of God that fed the people manna, manna from heaven. It was the manifestation of his presence that led the people by day in a cloud and by night in a fire. His presence was their survival. Without his presence, they would have perished in the wilderness. They didn't even know where they were going without him, without his, without that cloud in the daytime to follow. They wouldn't even know where they were going. And here's God's promise in Exodus 33 and down to verse 14. 
The Lord replied, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses talked to God in the change in his mind and to going along and to going with them. He was appointed to lead a nation. God used Moses to bring the Jewish nation out from bondage in Egypt. So now what are we going to do? They had crossed the Red Sea on dry land. The golden calf event had already happened. Moses had human frailties and he drew his strength from the presence of God. Even his brother Aaron couldn't be depended on. It was Aaron who made the golden calf. And then he lied about it. He formed the calf. But he told his brother that he threw the ornaments in and out came this calf. He lied about it. He couldn't even depend on his brother. But Moses said in verse 15, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses was desperate for the presence of God. Do not send us any farther if, without your presence if you're not with me and with us. Don't, send, don't let us go any farther. This job is too big for me. These were the same inadequacies he, he had expressed at the burning bush. He was a shepherd. He wasn't trained to lead a million and a half, two, three million people. He wasn't equipped or trained to lead a nation. I can't do this by myself. These people are fickle. I can't even depend on my brother. Verse 16, how will anybody know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? See, we are not like everybody else. We are not. We are to be separate from the others. Come out from among them and be separate. And in verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses replied in verse 18, then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for nowhere may, no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. We are the people of God. He has brought us out of the Egypt of sin. We were slaves. We were in bondage to the enemy, to our own sin. In Romans 6, 22 and 23, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. And verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Satan had us. The world had us. We're still in the world, but we're no longer part of the world. James 4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, if anyone chooses to be a friend of the world, becomes an enemy of God. We belong to God. 
He bought us, purchased our redemption with a price at the cost of his own blood shed on the cross of Calvary. He set us free from the law of sin and death. Jesus saw, satisfied the penalty that we deserved. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 6, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. On the cross of Calvary. Would you have been saved without the conviction of the Holy Spirit? No. no. We came through the Red Sea of our own sin. God brought us through that. God brought us through that. Our destruction was sure. We were bound for an eternity in the lake of fire. And that's where the sinners are on the way to. What were the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites doing that made God want to remove them from the land of Canaan? What were they doing? Murdering babies. In the worship of Baal, Chemosh, and Molech, those were the three gods in that vicinity, they were burning babies alive. Oh, we don't do that. We just dismember them. Tear their arms and legs off. Tear their head off. Bring them out in pieces. That's what we do. Can you imagine the spirit of a dismembered child saying, what did I do, Mommy? Why did you let them tear me apart? What did I do? What did I do? The other thing they were doing was perversion in the worship of Asherah. Every place there was a Baal shrine, there was an Asherah shrine. And it was perversion, sexual perversion, in that worship. Much of the world today has degenerated into the same hideous ideology. Satan is really pleased with how things are going on today. But God is not pleased. We're on a collision course with God. The world and its hideous ideology will not prevail. We will, but the world will not. Moses was desperate for the presence of God. He was desperate for God, and so God promised to go with him. We are desperate for the presence of God. He is with us. He is in us. When we accept Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Sometimes we feel like we're alone. Sometimes the challenges of life seem overwhelming. Things pop up in life that we're not prepared for. Trouble here and there. We get into a now what situation. What am I going to do now? How am I going to? Where am I going to? When will this all end? And Moses how am I going to lead all these people without the presence of God? I can't do that. So the world's people are desperate for God and don't know it. 
They turn their back on God. They put their hand out. Say, I don't want anything to do with you. I was that way. They think they can solve the world's problems on their own. The Republicans think they have the answer. The Democrats think they have the answer. The anarchists think they have the answer. The Marxists think they have Marxists think they have the answer. The socialists, communists think they have the answer. Some churches they think they have the answer. Just allow worldly practices to come into the church and everything will be cool. When they do that, they deny the power of God. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 1 to 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people it seems that most churches are denying God's power they're going through the motions it's called liturgy it's all about the church it's not about God no wonder sin creeps in churches they have their liturgy they have a list of prayers and all the words there to say in the prayers and they have certain vestitures they put on and liturgy it's all about the church we have the promise of the presence of God his presence with us Isaiah 41 10 so do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand in Deuteronomy 31 8 the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you do not be afraid and do not be discouraged God is with us the challenges of life are only brief and momentary sometimes it seems like a mountain of difficulty in front of us but compared with the eternity that awaits us these are just brief and momentary challenges but even believers feel like they're in a wilderness sometimes you ever feel that way like you're in a wilderness I remember a lady that came to our church there in Pinecroft her name was Daphne and she came to this church and she came down to the altar at the close of the service and I was on my way over to pray with her because you never leave a, a visitor that comes to the altar without going to pray for them. And I was on my way over there and a couple stopped me and asked me to pray for them as I was on my way over there and so I chased her down the, she got she she got up and left I was still praying for this couple she was about halfway down the side aisle and I chased her I chased her down the aisle I said wait a minute I was coming over to pray for you I said can I can we can I pray with you come back down can I pray with you And she said, I just got here and I'm in a wilderness. But she was quite a spirit filled believer. But I feel like I'm in a wilderness because she just got to Altoona, didn't have a job yet, didn't know what she was going to do. So I prayed with her, and she became good friends of ours. Black lady, her heritage was from Haiti. 
her sister still goes to church there. And we used to have a we used to have a, a small group that would meet in our house. And uh, she would come to that, and she would sit in the recliner until she did my back, and she would fall asleep. And my wife would cover her with a blanket, and we'd wake her up when the Bible study was over. And uh, she, uh, she must have been doing something that was exhausting because she was so tired. But when you're in a place where there's people that all have the presence of God, then peace is there. And maybe she didn't have a peaceful life, but peace was there, and she fell asleep. And she did that often. She had a master's degree in business administration, and she was a specialist in marketing. Uh, and her and her husband, he, he was in the Navy, and I think he had a some kind of an EMT or some kind of a technical background. And they eventually <coughs> left. I think they went to Maryland, where she was able to get a job in a, in a university doing what, uh, doing what she had been doing. But precious people, you have to reach out, you know. But she was in a wilderness because she didn't know what's going to happen next. Her husband wasn't really a believer. He would come sometimes. She had two children. I'm in a wilderness. I just got here and I'm in a wilderness. We do, spirit-filled believers get in a wilderness. We do, because we don't know what's going to happen next. But God is with us. The presence of God that Moses was so desperate for, we're desperate for too. Amen. Amen. Exodus 33, 17, And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Our Lord knows us by name. He's personal with us. That's why we, we say that he's our personal savior. He's our dearest friend. He's our best buddy. He said, I have called you friend. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We have the same promise that Moses had. God is with us. He goes with us. He stays with us. The world doesn't honor or even recognize him. They're full of self-glorifying ornaments. They're encapsulated beliefs. and Those are ornaments. They don't glorify God, they glorify humankind and their own self. The world doesn't honor or even recognize Him. Even believers sometimes have self-glorifying ornaments. I'm not talking about necklaces and earrings. I'm talking about the things we do that glorify our own self. To us believers, He must be sovereign over all. Sovereign over our attitudes. Our ad attitude can be an ornament. <laughs> sovereign over our thoughts. Sovereign over our actions, our opinions. The Lord must be sovereign over all. But we expect Him to go with us. To go with us into things that we don't see. Moses didn't know where he was going. He was desperate for God. He didn't know. He had never been in the land of Canaan. He didn't know those people. He was born in Egypt. He grew up in Egypt. Ran away from Pharaoh. Went out in the desert when he was 40 years old. Became a shepherd. And then God called him at the burning bush. And he knew God from that burning bush. And God appointed him to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, I can't do that. I can't speak well. I'm, I'm, I'm making all these excuses. But he did it. When God calls you to do something, just do it. God knows if you can do it or if you can't do it. God knows if you're prepared to do. I wasn't prepared to be a minister. I try to talk God out of that. I try to talk my way out of it. Just do it. And he will be 
I'm with you. His presence will be with you. Because he knows you by name. Would you stand? God is with us. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be in doubt. We don't have to be in fear. He's with us. He knows us by name. You guys don't have to be worried about what the, what the doctors are going to say. If I have a cardiologist, if I get a cardiologist that says you can't have your ice cream, I just get a different cardiologist. <laughs> All joking aside, dear Lord, we thank you today that you are with us, Lord, that your presence is with us, that we are assured in your holy word that your almighty presence will be with us. No matter what we go through, no matter what we're facing, it doesn't matter. You know us by name and you will be with us, Lord. We thank you for all the believers in the house today. We thank you for the ones that aren't here today. Pray that they're okay, Lord. And we pray that you'll bless the rest of this day and the rest of this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my friends.